Hey guys, these are your hemichordata and invertebrate chordate notes. So this is the final set of notes we're going to do before we move into actual chordates. So let's start by looking at it from an evolutionary perspective. So first of all, you need to understand that echinoderms, hemichordates, and chordates are all most likely derived from a common ancestor, especially since they all share deuterostome development. And this simply is when the blastopore becomes the anus. Now there are some characteristics of chordates you need to be familiar with. So there are four things that all chordates have in common. They have a dorsal tubular or hollow nerve cord. They have a notochord, pharyngeal slits or pouches, and a post-anal tail. Also important to note that both chordates and hemichordates have the following two characteristics in common. So they have pharyngeal slits, and most of them have a dorsal, sometimes hollow, nerve cord. The really important thing to note is that this shows that there are evolutionary ties between hemichordates and chordates, and those ties are closer than they are with echinoderms in either of those phyla. So let's take a minute and just look at this cladogram here. And so if you have your notes, you want to go ahead and sketch this, or if you're filling out the organizer, you can sketch that in the box. So we show echinoderms here, then enteropneusta is there, then pterobranchia, then we go into chordata. So these two are our hemichordates, and then chordata, of course, are the chordates. Now, if you look at some of these traits dividing them, so they all have a mesoderm from the archenteron, and the mouth is not from the blastopore. So that's where the anus development starts from the blastopore is here at this point. Then you can kind of look at some of the other ones. So echinoderms do not have the dorsal hollow nerve cord or the pharyngeal gill slits. And then we move up even further to the notochord and the post-anal tail are in chordata. Those are not necessarily in the hemichordates. So let's talk a little bit more about the hemichordates. So the term hemichordata in general simply means half cord. And this includes things like acorn, acorn worms and pterobranchs. And they live in or on marine sediments. So there are five characteristics of hemichordates that you need to know. First of all, they're marine, like we mentioned, and they're deuterostomes with bodies in three segments. So they have something called the proboscis, a collar, and a trunk, and we'll look further at that ana those anatomy things. They have ciliated pharyngeal slits, ciliated meaning they have those little hairs. They have an open circulatory system, a complete digestive tract, and that dorsal, sometimes hollow nerve cord that we've talked about. There are three classes of hemichordates, then, that we're going to discuss. First is class Enteropneusta. Now, this class is the acorn worms, and they're named because they have something called a proboscis at the anterior end. So if you look over here at this picture, this structure is the proboscis, and that's what simil is similar to an acorn in appearance, so that's where their name comes from. There are 75 species, and they're usually 10 to 40 centimeters in length. Most of them live in U-shaped burrows on the sandy shoreline, so that's where you're going to find these. And that proboscis that we talked about that looks like an acorn, it's also great assistance in feeding. The next class, pterobranchia. This name means wing or feather gills, and if you look over here, you can see why. They are very similar to some of the worms that we've talked about that live on the ocean floor as well. So there are around 20 species of these, and this is the most commonly known species, the Ratopleura. They are small, and they often live in tubes in asexually produced colonies. They do also have a proboscis, but it's more shield-like, and it secretes from the tube. They're found mostly in the deep oceans. So the acorn worms are going to be close to the shoreline. These ones are going to be in the deeper oceans, typically southern hemisphere and they use the cilia that's on their arms and tentacles to filter and transport food into their mouth. The final class is class Planktospheroidea. Now these have a spherical body and they have ciliary bands covering the surface. Once again, the U-shaped digestive tract, it is, they are considered coelomates, so they do have a coelom, but it is very poorly developed. They are known for their free swimming larvae and Ironically, there's only one species known to exist, and it's almost impossible to find a picture, so that's why we have a drawing. Finally, then, phylum chordata. So there are five characteristics of phylum chordata. First of all, bilateral symmetry in deuterostomes. They have the notochord, the pharyngeal slits or pouches, dorsal nerve cord, and post-anal tail present at some point of development, because you're probably thinking, wait a minute, 
I don't have gill slits or a tail. Yes, we are chordates, but this is earlier on in our development. We also have something called an endostyle, which produces mucus or a thyroid gland. They have a complete digestive tract and ventral contractile blood vessel, as also known as the heart. So here's some definitions of the phylum chordata that you need to be familiar with. So the notochord itself is just a supportive rod that extends most of the body length. Those pharyngeal slits we talked about that we have at some point in development, they're openings along the pharyngeal region. Invert chord chordates use this for filter feeding, but some chordates, we will use them for gas exchange, but it doesn't always stay with the chordates throughout their lifetime. That dorsal hollow nerve cord then runs along the length of the body, and this is what is associated with the development of complex sensory systems. So this is also important to note that this is largely responsible for chordate success. We have a central nervous system. We have all of those sensory features within our bodies. We have very well-developed brains. So that dorsal hollow nerve cord is a huge reason why chordates are so successful. And finally, a postanal tail. So there are a couple of subphylums we're going to discuss here. So subphylum urocodata are no, known as the tunicates or sea squirts. Now, you may be thinking they look a little more like jellyfish than almost chordates, but they are actually closer to us in relation. So some species are solitary, others are colonial, they can be either one. They are sessile as adults, meaning they don't move. They are mobile, however, during their larval stages. They have all five chordate characteristics as larvae, and that is why they are categorized as being chordates versus something like a jellyfish. They also, just so you kind of know how they settle, they settle head first into a hard substrate, and that's where they undergo that dramatic metamorphosis, and all those chordate characteristics disappear, and they end up looking something like this. A little bit more about them. So they're called sea squirts, and they're covered by something called a tunic. So this tunic is made of protein, salts, and cellulose, and it encloses a basket-like pharynx. This has gill slits as well. So they use an oral siphon. They're going to trap that plankton that comes in here, if you see with that arrow, and a sheet of mucus and cilia, and then it just directs it to the stomach. The water is then going to leave the organism through that atrial siphon and they do have a very small digestive system as well. The other subphylum we're going to talk about is cephalochordata. So there are 45 species here, and they're called lancelets. Now, they look very similar to some of the fish and the lampreys and things we're going to talk about more in detail. The name itself means head cord. They are exclusively marine. They like shallow waters and clean sands, and they're tadpole-like animals only up to 5 centimeters, so not very big. And it's important to note that although they are capable of swimming, they're usually buried in the sand with their anterior end exposed. They do have all chordate characteristics, those five things we talked about throughout their life history. And most of the cells in the notochord are muscle cells, which is important because that is what makes them unlike other chordates. So their notochord is actually a contractile muscle versus ours that does not function like that whatsoever. And that's all for your notes.